Hey, good morning, Marvel United fans, or good whatever time of day you're watching. It doesn't have to be morning. I'm not here to judge. Welcome to Digital Charcuterie. I'm Andrew Fantasia. Welcome back to another Marvel United update video. Uh, just some little bits and bobs today, and then we're going to play round two of our What's That Movie game. But let's take things in stride. First of all, welcome back. It's been a minute. Uh, it's been a minute since there have been any substantial big updates, so I wanted to kind of hold out till we got one of those. And now, one of those have arrived. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit, you know, I'm not going to go too super long into it, but I do want to share a personal story about why Marvel United resonated so much, particularly with me. But we'll get there when we get there. First of all, Updates. So the latest update email, they come bi-weekly, arrived in the inboxes today for all the Marvel United Multiverse backers talking about what's going on, right? The Chinese New Year delay, uh, I say delay, it wasn't, you know, it's just they have a holiday. It's it's not a bad thing. So they had their Chinese New Year, uh, and the Lunar New Year is over now, and uh, now they're, they're back on their regularly scheduled programming, so things are picking up again. And according to the email, this is what Simon had to say about the status of the Multiverse Pledge. So the factories are back online after Chinese New Year and we just received an update on how things are going. Unfortunately, and when I saw that word, I cringed a little bit, but it's okay. Unfortunately, the mass production copies are taking a little longer than expected and they are just now starting to send us the first MPCs for approval. They should all be in our hands by the end of the month. That said, the factory expects they should be able to speed up the final phase of production so delivery doesn't get delayed past the previous estimates. Product assembly should be finished by mid-April, followed by assembling all the individual backer pledges, which should be done by late May, as estimated previously. Then shipping can begin. All right, so lots of things going on there. It's going to be a busy couple months at the factory. Um, I, mean, I know we're all just so excited to get our hands on this game. Half of us are probably ready to board a plane to China and just go to the factory and be like, can we help? <laughs> can, we, can we, anything we can do to contribute, to, to speed this along? That's the status of things right now. The word unfortunately really scared me because I was like, oh no, I can't handle any more delays. Uh, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Maybe, I don't want to jinx it. Uh, but it looks like the factory is saying they can speed up the, the second half of this process, which would be awesome. I don't want the people in that factory to work themselves to the bone because it's not worth it. It's just a game, right? Their their health is more important. But if they are confident that they can zoom some parts of it along safely, sure. Uh, and then that means they can start sending out everything in late May. We have just entered the month of March. It's March 1st right now as I record this. And the previous initial forecast when they announced this whole Kickstarter to begin with was that we would be getting our pledges by the end of this month. Obviously, that's not the case anymore. Um, but it's it's funny to look back at how I was counting down the months once the pledge ended. And we have now reached the month where it would have been the month we get it. But, uh, you know... That's, that's just how it is sometimes. I just, I can't wait uh, for the pledges to just start rolling out. I can't wait for that email that just says they've been shipped, right? Because that's peace of mind. That At that point, it's like, we know it's coming. As long as it's in the factory, it could keep getting delayed and delayed and delayed. But as, if it's on the container and it's out, then at that point, we can be like, okay, It'll get here soon. I can't wait to uh, see when the, the backers start getting it, particularly uh, my friend the Meeple Monkey, who lives in Australia, which means he will be one of the first ones to get it. So that's cool. That means I can look forward to his unboxing video of it, and I'll get to see just all the juicy components and how they look when they're in their final, fully colored, presentable form. So I'm telling you right now, once that email comes from Kickstarter saying, hey, everything's been shipped, so you know, check your mail. Uh, I'm going to be just refreshing the page on Meeple Monkey's channel to be like, did he get it? Did he get it? Did he get it? Let's see. But until then, they have been giving us these great white samples, uh, which I don't think they did last time with X-Men. Uh, I think this is the first time they've done it. I could be wrong. But they're giving us these beautiful white samples so we can see the process. I would love if there was like, I would just love to see a, a documentary film about how something like this gets made. Like, what is the process from start to finish? So that I have a better idea of what we're waiting so long for, right? What does each chunk take time-wise? Maybe someday Simon will make a documentary. I don't know. Or I'll make it for them in exchange for a free season four of Marvel United. <laughs> that's, my, uh, th that's my fee. 
Simon, you listening? But these white samples are great and they give us a look uh, this month. Uh, they've given us a look at the War of Kings, which is just a beautiful expansion box, chock full, right? There's nine minis in there and they look great, especially Crystal. That Crystal mini is like the crown jewel of this whole season, pretty much. Like she's fantastic. We also got a look at the Pets box, which is exactly what we expected. Just a tiny little box with the six minis and the cards. That's all you need, right? It doesn't need to be anything crazy fancy. The Iron Lad box is going to be like Kickstarter's your Mohawk Storm, right? She comes in a little box and then you just pull Iron Lad out and put him in the multiverse thing because there's a spot for him. Love that. And then finally, Fin Fang Foom, who's got uh, removable wings and he's got the cards in this little vertical slot, which I think is pretty funny, or rather horizontal. The cards are popping out horizontally over Fin Fang Foom's head. But there is something that worries me a little bit about this Fin Fang Foom thing. And I'll show you what I mean. So this is a dragon piece from the game Arcadia Quest, which was the very first Kickstarter I ever backed, period. And it was a Simon game, too. So this is, you know, keeping it in the family. Uh, but they did a whole uh, part, a season of Arcadia Quest where there were dragons everywhere. And you could get, I think, four different colored dragons. It's amazing. It's a gorgeous mini because it's Simon. But they had the same kind of thing where, like we saw with Fin Fang Foom, the wings come off so that you can store him back in the box, right? And these wings just pop right off very easily so you can store him away, right? There's big slots in there. But the thing that worries me is I have three of these dragons from when I backed it, and the wings are really fickle. The wings really come out too easily for my liking, especially with one of the other ones who I can't locate at the moment, the black one. His wings, like you, you breathe near him and the wings would fall out. So I'm just worried about the handling of Fin Fang Foom. Like if we're going to be moving him around the board, every time he moves, are his wings going to just fall out? Because that would be a bummer. The minis have been great quality though so far in all of Marvel United. So I'm going to give Simon and Spin Master the benefit of the doubt here. But I hope that they, since Arcadia Quest, I just hope that they have perfected the wing mechanism of their dragons because this Fin Fang Foom that we saw today looks incredible. He's so scary, he's so big. They showed him next to Iron Lad. He looks like he's gonna be bigger than the Sentinels and almost as big as Galactus, which is perfect, right? Nobody should be bigger than Galactus. No, there should not be a mini in this whole game that surpasses him, but Fin Fang Foom should get pretty close. So I think they worked that size out wonderfully. Uh, so I just hope the wing situation so look, this, this fell out in my hand right now as I was talking about it. I hope the wing situation on Finny, Finny, that's what I call him now because we know each other, uh, is a little more secure than the wing situation on these guys, even though these guys still look terrific. Arcadia Quest was a fun game too. All right, I wanted to share a little story. It's one of my favorite memories from my childhood uh, that I wanted to share with all of you because I've talked about something in the past a lot here in these videos, but I haven't gone into this particular detail. I don't think anyway, if I have, forgive me. I'm old and I forget what I say and what I don't say, but in the process of becoming a Marvel United fan since I discovered this game, right, and meeting other Marvel United fans, you know, just kind of joining these communities, on YouTube and on Facebook, particularly the Marvel United Fanatics group on Facebook, where there's a lot of cool people up there who just show off their great paint jobs and all that, right? I noticed a trend where, and this is not to, I'm not saying this to like bash on these particular people who say this. I'm just, it's just something I noticed where, you know, people would talk about, oh, season four, what would season four be like? And a bunch of us would bring up ideas, you know, like personally me, I would love to see, there's a bunch more Spider-Man and Hulk characters I would love to see, right? Like the leader and the prowler and, and then, you know, Jackal, all that Hydro Man, you know, people bring up their ideas like, oh, we would love to see these characters from Generation X or these characters from Ghost Rider or whatever. And then I would see a lot of comments responding to that with people just saying, nah, I don't want those characters. I'm not interested in those characters. Or even people saying, hey, I'm selling these six characters from season one because I don't want them. I, I don't care about those characters. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to bash those people, right? You like what you like? That's all good, my friends. But I just wanted to sort of share things from my point of view because to me, the idea of getting characters that I'm hungry for, like Hobgoblin, is super exciting. But what I also love about this game is when I am given characters that I had no context for, but I get to learn about them and I get to add them to my roster, right? Like characters like Boom Boom. I had no idea who Boom Boom was. Now I love Boom Boom. It just... 
The thought of Boom Boom makes me smile. Agent Venom. Never heard of Agent Venom, but now we're getting Agent Venom, and I thought, oh, that's cool. I Now I know something, a new thing about Marvel that I didn't know before, and I'm happy to add him to the giant army of characters that are going to be at my beck and call, right? And it stems from a childhood memory that I just wanted to share because it's just it's a fun memory that I love. I've brought up many times before how the pinnacle of Marvel to me as a kid, the thing that made Marvel special to me was those Fox cartoons, the 1990s cartoons, uh, particularly Spider-Man and X-Men. Those did something to my kid brain and I could not tell you, I need a psychology major probably to tell you exactly what they did and why they did it. The way the characters looked in those shows, it was the most vibrant, colorful batch of cartoons that I've ever seen in my life to this day. I've seen some great cartoons. None of them look as vibrant and colorful as those. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, but uh, thankfully I was able to get a couple of toys from that show. Uh, my mom got me Spider-Man and Craven and Kingpin, because Kingpin was my favorite, right? So I had those three. Uh, unfortunately, over the years, I lost them because that's what happens when you're a kid, you lose toys. You know, recently, within the last, like, decade, I found Mr. Kingpin again at, like, a fan expo, right? So I, I bought him because of just nostalgia purposes, and I got, to, I got to have my Kingpin cake back again and eat it too, right? There he is. He's not the most articulate toy in the world, but he was my favorite. He's my favorite comic book character, period, to this day. So it's nice to have a kingpin back in my hands again and just holding him, you know, it brings me right back to 95, 96. But here's the thing. Here's how this connects to Marvel United. When you get those action figures, right, you get them on this cardboard. I, I saved the kingpin cardboard. But then, of course, you flip it over the back and there'd be information about kingpin. And then there's the, the thing that parents hate and kids love, which is the collect them all thing. Now, I learned at that young age that the Spider-Man cartoon and the X-Men cartoon were all connected. And then I also learned, hey, there's other cartoons like Fantastic Four and Iron Man, and those are connected too. And they all intermingle. And that blew my young mind to pieces. I was just like, oh my God, right? So like Human Torch can team up with Cyclops one day and go fight Kingpin? That's a thing that could happen? And I thought, well, the cartoons kind of stay in their lane. There's crossovers, but every once in a while the cartoons stay in their lane. So therefore, if I wanted to see the kind of just gigantic epic crossovers that my heart was yearning for, I thought, well, if I got every toy, I could do that. I could create my own Marvel saga with everybody and I could have Storm and Iron Man be friends and then have Black Panther show up and just be like, hey, can I be friends too? Right? I could, that could be a whole thing that I could do. But of course, like I said, we did not have a whole lot of money growing up. So those three toys, Kingpin, Craven, and Spider-Man, that was all we could afford. That's it. You got Kingpin, Craven, and Spider-Man. Have fun with those. Right? So I did this thing one day. And it's one of my favorite memories where I was just, I was so thirsty for particularly the Spider-Man world. And I wanted so badly to have all those characters at my disposal. And I knew I couldn't get them toy-wise. So I did the next best thing. I took my Spider-Man toy and I traced him on a piece of paper, like a dead body. I, I traced the outline of Spider-Man. So I had that tracing and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm like seven years old at this point, seven or eight. I thought, all right, Spider-Man is an average sized guy. He's not too short. He's not too tall. He's just average. So using that tracing as my baseline, I drew every other character in the Spider-Man universe to scale with him. So if I was drawing Mary Jane, she was a tiny bit shorter than Peter, so I made her a little bit smaller than Spider-Man. And then somebody like Rhino, I drew him and I made him considerably bigger than Spider-Man, etc. And I kept going and going until I had drawn every Spider-Man character, including some ones that weren't on the show, but that I wanted to see, like a Spider-Woman and, and such, and even a couple of X-Men characters, uh, the ones I knew about anyway. And then when I was done and I had them all and they were all exactly the scale, I cut them out and I glued them to like pieces of cardboard so that they were a little sturdy and I colored them in with pencil crayon and I had very cheap homemade figures of 30 or 50 Marvel characters, right? And using those, using those little paper cutouts that I made, I started to make my own Marvel saga out of that. And it wasn't action figures, but it was as close as I could get. And to this day, I, you know, I still think about those and, you know, it puts a smile on my face. There's just something 
primal about that feeling that I had when I realized all of these and all of those other X-Men characters and everything could go together and I could make them tell whatever stories I wanted them to tell and I didn't have to be constrained to what was happening on the cartoon. That did something to my brain that has never fully stopped happening, right? It's, it's been there ever since, uh, which is part of the reason why I love the MCU so much because it's kind of playing with that idea to on a grander scale. But then along comes Marvel United and Marvel United pretty much lets you do exactly that. Now you might be thinking, oh, there's tons of Marvel games other than United that do that. Marvel Crisis Protocol did that. Marvel Hero Clicks, Marvel Legendary. Every big Marvel game lets you mix and match characters from everywhere. And you're right, but they're all missing one ingredient. And that ingredient is the art style. A lot of Marvel games, particularly stuff like Legendary, it's comic booky and it's a bit darker and grittier. And I don't love that art style all that much, especially when something like Marvel United exists, where it is literally how the cartoons looked. Aside from the chibi style, obviously, but the colors are, the reds are the brightest reds, the greens are the juiciest greens, the yellows are the most vibrant yellows. It is exactly how the cartoon portrayed all these people. And when I see certain folks on the Facebook uh, Marvel United Fanatics who paint their minis in that cartoony way, it makes me so happy just to see that. And it really makes me wish I could paint and could afford painting supplies so that I would do that to my own minis, but I'm fine leaving them unpainted uh, rather than messing them up with my lack of paint skills. Very long story short, that is why Marvel United struck a chord with me, is because it took that art style, this art style, uh, this vibrant, bright, juicy, colorful art style that I grew up with, and it translated it into a board game that was all the Marvel people together at your beck and call to have whatever adventures you want them to have. So it's really like 1995 Andrew's wildest dream come true at last, almost 30 years later. So that is why Marvel United became such a big presence for me and why it became my favorite board game ever and why I love it so much that I do these crazy videos about it. Um, and, you know, share the fun with uh, all you people out there, all you fellow fans, because of how it plucked this piece of my childhood and turned it from a dream into a reality. So that's Marvel United. That's why I love it so much. And uh, if anybody who's watching this is part of CMON or who helped make the game, thank you. Thank you for, you know, delighting young Andrew, because I'm still young at heart, and uh, giving him what he's wanted since he was seven years old. Okay, enough strolls down memory lane. It's time to say goodbye, but before we do, we are going to play round two of our game, What's That Movie? So if you missed it last time, here's how the game works. I'm going to show you a batch of Marvel United characters, anywhere from two to four, maybe even more Marvel United characters. And your job is you have to guess what movie I'm trying to tell you about based on the actors who have played the characters you see on your screen. But of course you have to think outside the box, right? Yes, Tom Holland plays Spider-Man. But you know who else played Spider-Man? Josh Keaton, Christopher Daniel Barnes, Andrew Garfield, Tobey Maguire, right? So just because you see Spider-Man, don't automatically think it's the Spider-Man that you're most familiar with, right? That's how it works. So first, let's go over what I gave you in the last video and reveal the answers to those puzzles. And then I'll give a shout out to the person who answered them the fastest. So last time I gave you Star-Lord, Bishop, and Kingpin. The answer to that was Jurassic World because Chris Pratt, Omar Sy, and Vincent D'Onofrio all appeared in Jurassic World. Next was Valkyrie, Human Torch, and Kang. The answer to that is Creed III. Kang is played by Jonathan Majors, who is in Creed 3, as was Tessa Thompson. And Human Torch was played in the movie that nobody liked by Michael B. Jordan, who was the star of Creed 3. The next one is Captain Marvel, Nick Fury, and Loki. Brie Larson, Samuel L. Jackson, and Tom Hiddleston all appeared together in Kong Skull Island. And last but not least, Elektra, Deadpool, Gamora, and Hulk. What do they have in common? Well, Jennifer Garner, Ryan Reynolds, Zoe Saldana, and Mark Ruffalo were all in the Netflix film The Atom Project, which, in my opinion, promised a lot but delivered very little. So we had a few good guesses, but the person who guessed the fastest and got them all right was Screw Top Reviews. And Screw Top Reviews got the answers insanely fast. I don't think the video had even been up for an hour before 
they posted all the correct answers. So Screw Talk Reviews, congratulations, my friend. You, that is well done. Now we're going to do our second round. Now our second round is still a little bit easy, right? I'm still kind of working you into this game. Uh, but in future videos, they're going to get a lot more difficult. And I think when that happens, I will have some physical prizes to send out to the first person to guess those because those ones are substantially more outside the box. All right. And also, you know, see if you can challenge yourself to try to do this without Googling. Here is the next batch of puzzles. Round two of What's That Movie? Here we go. First one is Wasp, Doctor Strange, Magneto, and Ronin. Next, Daredevil and Kingpin. Then, Shang-Chi, Storm, and Super Scroll. And finally, Hobgoblin, Red Hulk, and Claw. Now your job is to tell me in the comments below what's that movie. And just like today, the first one who guesses them all right in the comments will get a shout out in the next video. And starting next time, they're going to get harder. So yeah, there will probably be some physical prizes going out to those winners in the future. But that has been it for today. I've been kept to you too long already. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. We are chugging along here as we continue here on Digital Charcuterie to make the wait for Marvel United Multiverse a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. So I'll see you next time, my friends. Until then, adios.